Dean Young is going to talk to us about whatever he wants, and I think he's going to engage us in a conversation. So uh, you're going to need to speak up when you ask questions. And uh, Dean Young. Great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, uh, I I'm not smart enough to speak to this group, particularly about technology. So I thought the safest thing to do is try to uh, have you talk and uh, have us share some things. But I'll give you a couple of words of uh, what I think is the context for inviting me to come and, and have conversations with you. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> I was fine until I entered this room. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, all of a sudden, I'm uh, choking and getting hoarse. Uh, maybe it's a sign. <laughs> Andy and I have wonderful conversations, and uh, I, they're usually challenging for me because I have to have him keep repeating things till I can get them and <coughs> figure them out. But uh, but he he asks me questions, you know, and, and he says things like, well, what do you think the future of technology is in education? And I say, well, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> he usually has a lot of great thoughts. Uh, but he also says, uh, you know, well, what do you think things are going in education, in higher education, in public schools, or I should say K-12 schools, because there's a lot of options out there now of how younger children get their education. <clears throat> um, where does IP and as a department fit in to all of these sort of things? Um, I, I don't really know the answers to any of those things, but there, uh, there's a lot of, to me, really fascinating and exciting things that have to do with technology. But a few, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and if you recall, I, uh, I, I don't know if I was really high tech and sent him an email or I picked up the phone and called him uh, or stopped him in the hall, but I said, Andy, will you write a definition of the word technology and send it to me? And he did. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I, don't, I don't want him to comment on that right now. I'll ask him to in a minute. But I'd like to hear from some of you, students or faculty or others, uh, how would you define technology? <clears throat> what does that mean to you? I like it as any means to manipulate the world around us, like our impact on controlling things. <clears throat> wow, that's an <clears throat> interesting and broad definition. Uh, <clears throat> No answer can be right or wrong, because I wouldn't know it as right or wrong anyway. In fact, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, but that's an interesting way to think about it. Yes? I think technology as a definition would be any tool that adds value to an individual or a group of individuals. Okay. And how would you define tool? Um, very broadly. <laughs> Even if it's not on uh, uh, Kindle? It doesn't have to be <laughs> electronic to be technology. Okay, good. Let's see, someone else had a comment. I was just going to add to that. That helped you get something done more effectively than without it. Okay, good. But getting around, getting to that notion of effectiveness, I, the term leverage comes to mind. Something that allows us to, to leverage natural, natural capacities that we have. Uh, a book does that <clears throat> because it has, it's a means of recording things that I might say to someone else. And so, but th those are lost in time, whereas a book gives me the opportunity to record it. Good. Andy, what would you add to that definition from you? I was afraid of that. I've been, <laughs> my mind is racing, Dean. 
um, to me, uh, there's there's a, an analogy you can make between an irrigation system and technology. Uh, the farmer doesn't make the water flow, but the farmer takes advantage of the flow of water to get it where the water needs to go or he wants it to go. And so the farmer constructs something to conduct the natural energies to the place where they can be consumed. Um, and, and that metaphor can be used to describe the computer or the use of, of tools, uh, our processes. They're all, they all have to do with directing energy toward some source. So now it comes. So is, uh, is the farmer's irrigation system with its gates and ditches and trenches, is that a technology? Absolutely. Okay. Now, <clears throat> those of you that are students in IP and T, you didn't, uh, I don't think you came here and got into the graduate program in this department uh, at BYU uh, to design irrigation ditches or to even learn how to necessarily write a book, although that may be a byproduct of, of your education. Um, but uh, probably, you know, so, so narrow your <coughs> definition a little bit. What, in terms of when you, did, when you joined or got admitted to a department of instructional psychology and technology, what was in your mind? about what you were going to be doing as a student in instructional technology. So we can start to narrow the definition a little bit. Mm -hmm. Corporate e-learning. Corporate e-learning. Okay. Say, just say, I mean, probably everybody knows what you mean, but just say a little bit more. To you personally, why, why, why was that important to you personally? I'm, I'm interested in, in making, uh, improving learning systems in the corporate environment um, through the use of uh, any type of technology. I, I, I prefer a loose definition of the term e-learning. Okay. So, but as you, as you were thinking about corporate e-learning, you're probably thinking about instructional, instruction, instructional design and so on mm -hmm. that takes advantage of Hardware and software and so yeah, on. Yeah, what hardware and software to use, exactly. Okay, somebody else. Why did you get into instructional technology? Randy? I think all of the faculty probably thought about this a lot too, but uh, there, there's these broad categories of educational technologies, and then those are subcategories of what we call the instructional technologies, which is technologies that facilitate instruction, and then there's the learning technologies, which is technology that facilitate learning which may be formal or informal. And so you, you start to kind of categorize these things. And so we use technology to facilitate learning, which is a lot of what we do. But we also encourage, for instance, what Charles is doing with Blended Learning, the use of technologies to facilitate that learning, and not necessarily the instruction itself. Okay. Good. Other students, any of you want to make a statement about what you want, what your interest is? Um, to me, I, well, I think my primary interest is like kind of leveraging like internet tools to just make education more accessible for people like in general, like Khan Academy kind of type stuff is what I was interested in. So a wider sweep of people having access to learning. But let me ask another question that's kind of a little different, the other part of this, the, the title. Our conversation. <clears throat> How would you define education? So we said, you know, is there a future for technology? What's the future of technology and education? What, how do you define education? Mm -hmm. Why, It's interesting that we have the title of instruction and in our program and we're talking about uh, education um, those seem different because they're different words um, I think education has to do with 
uh, has, has to do with uh, teaching and learning, and both are of equal importance. Are they always connected, or can they be separate? They're they're inseparably connected. So you can't learn without teaching. I don't think so. How would you define teaching? Teaching is anything that happens that facilitates learning. Maybe going around the circle, see there's a hand over here somewhere and <laughs> back there. Well, I was going to say education to me is the process by which someone is able to increase their ability or their skills and create in them uh, opportunities that didn't exist before. So it actually moves them somehow through a process. Um, I would argue like education kind of in the narrow sense, like educational system. I like guess just kind of a formalization, kind of making explicit and trying to systematically improve like the passive learning experiences that everyone experiences going throughout their life. So just further what's already happening in any case. Uh, so kind of from that context, um, how, is, how is teaching and learning changing? I think it's changed a lot in my lifetime. Some of you that younger, maybe not as much, but uh, <clears throat> how, is, how is teaching and learning, how is that process, that interactive process, is that changing and how? I think one of the biggest changes is the teaching isn't embodied <coughs> by people so much as it is there's more information available through so many more resources. So a teacher isn't necessarily a person. It can be a recorded person. It can be the writings of a person that's now more available than they were before. And it can also be um, virtual people. It's just kind of getting back to your definitions, I think, right? And I think there's a lot more teaching happening that way in our <coughs> world. It, it's more almost absorb a, a, a process of absorbing in your existence than it is some type of exchange of information in a fixed setting. Okay. Well, we could talk about some of these things a lot <clears throat> in different ways, but let me tweak it a little bit more and uh, hear some of your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> the university, Charles Graham was on it, had put together a committee, uh, an innovations task force. Was it two years ago now? Has it been that long? Anybody else here was part of that? Uh, okay. Well, not the university. The college uh, the, the, well, the university committee. Yeah. Um, and um, this group got together, spent a lot of time, did a lot of work, uh, wrote a report, <clears throat> and they, they addressed things like, um, <clears throat> are there ways that we can make learning uh, teaching and learning, or learning at BYU, more effective and more efficient. We have a lot of challenges uh, that stand before education, before universities, K-12 systems of schooling, and, and so on. We have a lot of challenges out there uh, to look at and address. And at universities, uh, you know, there's, there's limited resources. Uh, at BYU, <coughs> Every year, the percentage of students that apply that get rejected is increasing. Uh, this past year, or the, the current year that we're in, uh, it was a little under 50%, uh, not quite half, but real close. People are projecting that maybe by fall of 2013 or fall of 2014, it's possible that we could be rejecting or turning down 50% or more of the applicants. There's also this huge growth curve uh, worldwide of members of the church who are in that age span of 18 to 25, 26, in that age range when we typically think of a lot of people going to universities. 
that is just going to climb. It, we've actually been on a decline. So as the BYU, number of applicants every year to BYU has increased, the percentage of those we have to say no to because we have a ceiling, uh, you know, that percentage of rejection, if you will, is growing. But we've now bottomed out <clears throat> in terms of the number of individuals in the church who are in that age range of typical entering, beginning college students. And the curve is now on its way up. And the projections are that we could have, in a few years, we could easily have doubled the number of applicants that we have today and may not have one single additional slot, student slot, to add to. Right now, basically, how many students start in the fall depends on how many graduate uh, by August of that current uh, academic year. Uh, and we have people end up on wait lists, and we see if everybody that thinks they're graduating actually graduate before we finalize who can all come in. So, you know, people are saying, gee, are there ways to, now, we, we haven't been given, i got to be careful here, we have not been asked or given a charge by our board of trustees uh, to increase the number uh, of ways we might increase the number or how we might educate more people or have more in the learning process. But there are a lot of conversations that uh, people are thinking about and having about, you know, as things change and grow, are there ways to be more efficient, to educate more or better or make it more effective? And yet at the same time, have you, any, any of you ever heard the phrase, the BYU experience? How many have heard that phrase? Uh, that's a big thing to our board of trustees, to our president, and to others at BYU, the faculty and the staff, is that we believe people, students can come to BYU and have a very unique BYU experience that would be a little different than they might get at any other university. <clears throat> Their education might be every bit as good, maybe even better. They might have wonderful social experiences. They might have wonderful spiritual experiences. But overall, the experience coming to BYU is different and it will and it is um, probably just about any place else and I I think the experience at BYU Idaho, BYU Hawaii, BYU Provo are all very different experiences uh, and so there's some unique things about having a, a college education at Brigham Young University <laughs> and some people are very concerned about what if we do something that changes that in a way that could end up being negative? It's not as powerful and as helpful in strengthening and growing testimonies and strengthening faith in God and in the Savior and what we do. And those are pretty high priorities. If you look at the aims of the BYU education, what's the first thing that's mentioned on the list of the four aims? Spiritually, Spiritually strengthening. So that's a very important part of it. So, if we start to, to look at ways to address issues of efficiency, effectiveness, or whatever, and we start looking at things in technology, what will that do? Will that help? Will it hinder? Will it be neutral? But this committee that Charles served on, they looked at a lot of things. And they looked at a lot of things having to do with technology in the sense, technology in the sense of instructional design, um, the methods of delivering instruction, using hardware, software, blended learning, flipped classes. They looked at all kinds of things and they came back to the president with a report. And uh, I, it's not a report that's been made a public document yet or circulated. Um, but uh, we've had uh, several now considerable late meetings uh, at the vice presidents and the dean's council talking about that report. Uh, I should say that the committee also considered non, yeah. you know, changes in calendaring, I mean, lots of different kinds of ways in technology or, yeah. you know, digital technology was one piece of that, right. not the whole. Thank you for, for clarifying that. And in our discussion, Dean's, with the vice presidents, yeah. 
our system is broad as well. But we've had a lot of discussion on the technological front of things. So, so there are a lot of issues and questions that remain to be asked, to be looked at, to be studied. Um, what about K-12 education? Is technology changing and having any impact there? What experiences have you had or what have you observed? <coughs> seems to be changing what they're doing in the classroom now where a lot more content learning is taking place at home and a lot more collaborative activities and group work can take place in the classroom. Definitely. I had I had someone in a meeting I was in recently say uh, that if you went into a kindergarten class today, it would be absolutely no different than what it was 40 or 50 years ago. And I suggested that he had been in elementary schools or kindergarten classes recently because uh, I have, and they're not, I didn't see anybody with graham crackers and a blanket taking a nap, which was a common thing when I was back in that, that realm. Uh, you know. Uh, maybe that was an individualized education for me because they knew I, I like graham crackers. <laughs> but uh, is that what personalized <laughs> learning is about? <laughs> so, but so things things are changing. It's different. I was. This is not a public school or a private school, but uh, a few weeks back, uh, I was visiting a, a class in our church in our ward, a Sunday school class with one of the youth classes. And the, the teacher, you, you're all aware that there's a new curriculum now of how they're encouraging people to teach the youth and young men, young women in Sunday school. And this teacher had really worked very hard to prepare using the new guidelines and resources and materials to teach this group. And she had a, a video and she brought in a recently purchased iPad so she could just show it right on that. and. Uh, and worked with these students, and, and she came in and was teaching a lesson, got to that point, looked out the iPad to bring it up and show it, and she couldn't bring it up and show it, uh, partially because it was a clip she was bringing in from YouTube. And most churches, I don't know if it's all of our LDS churches, but most churches are blocked from, from YouTube. And she said something like, oh, I'm really disappointed that I can't show you this clip. And I think she had about 14 year olds. And one girl said, oh, I can fix that for you. Well, I, I was there and I said, well, it's because your church is blocked. You can't get YouTube in here. And the student said, oh, I'll get that for you. She whips out her smartphone, uh, gets the thing, transports it to the, to the iPad and the teacher is using on the Wi-Fi and using the iPad and it took all of 60 seconds and the teacher didn't even know what had happened, uh, and, and yet, but there was the video. Uh, so the technology in many aspects and all these different formats is changing things, and it's, it's making a difference, and yet we have a lot to learn in the city about that. I would broaden it even further beyond BYU, beyond K-12, and uh, cite uh, a writer from uh, 1968, a professor at Harvard at the time, who come from Great Britain, by the name of I.A. Richards, who, who at the time talked about the state that the world was in and said that the problem that the world faces is there are not enough educated people. And he said, we don't have enough the, the means to educate those who need education. I would add to that, there probably are not enough trees to print the books that would be necessary to help the people around the world who are literate today become literate. So something's got to be done to change the, the way things are going beyond even just the LDS population that won't have a seat here in, in Provo, or uh, Rexburg, or Laetia. Exactly. Thank you for that comment. So that brings me to, to this question from you as students, because first of all, I recognize that uh, uh, I'm not real technologically, uh, digitally uh, adaptive. I'm not a digital native. Uh, I don't do too badly for an old guy, but uh, you know, uh, I'm not a whiz at all of these things, and I learn and I keep trying to do new things and, and take advantage of things. But you know, you 
uh, are so much more adept to this. Your knowledge, your expertise, your abilities are just so, so, and you think so fast and so differently and so out of the box. So, knowing that, you as students, um, what sort of things should we be thinking about and doing? Now, and we're going to come to IP and T as an apartment in a second, but, you know, at both higher education and in K-12 education, what kinds of things should we be thinking about? What should we do? How, how should we explore and start looking for efficiency and effectiveness and improving things that might involve technology? Rick? I think the easiest uh, fruit for, the low-hanging fruit for us is to figure out how to make learning more efficient and how to convey information better. We can do that. I think we need to tackle the harder problems of how do we not lose things like the BYU experience. How can we be more efficient, more expansive, but yet also still personable and human in the kinds of learning and teaching that we do. Okay. What else? Great answer. Um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to share something personal that I've been thinking about um, for the last uh, little while. My confession is that uh, I don't feel like I'm, I'm the best e-learning developer. Um, as I've splashed around in that community for a little while, I've discovered that there are so many people, especially outside of the United States, that are leaps and bounds uh, ahead of me in that area. I feel like the greatest contribution I can make is um, gathering those people um, together. And, and what I'd like to do is um, somehow focus my attention on reaching out to these other universities and professionals and individuals through the ever-growing um, abilities that technology affords us today in terms of communication and try to connect um, all these different experts and, uh, and, and really maximize on, on, uh, on that sense of community. I don't know if that, I expressed my idea in any way anybody could understand, but. You're taking collaboration far beyond anything I've ever attempted to do or thought of doing, uh, in a sense. I mean, it's a sharing and it's a taking advantage of and learning, but capabilities to do those kind of things exist on now. I think, too, that one of the contributions we can make is um, making sure we're not trying to force the students out of the life they live in into a, an education life. I mean, they live in technology, and they're used to instantaneous feedback and connection, and, you know, any way we can contribute in their process of education to, to duplicating that experience for them the more likely it is that learning is just part of their life as opposed to something they have to do. And so I think that we have a lot to contribute in terms of looking at what they bring with them in terms of the choices they make and how to reach out and communicate and collaborate and trying to integrate that into the education process they're experiencing. I think there's a lot we have to do to be able to understand as these kids are growing up or uh, as they're their life is just so technologically absorbed and education can't ignore that because then the students won't engage. And engagement's a big thing, isn't it? I saw several other hands. Yes. Um, I think one thing we could do is, uh, I was just thinking about what Dr. West said about there's some things we can do about us sharing information and making that more efficient. We, we want to answer the hard question of how do we conserve the OU experience, which is so important. But like, maybe one thing we could do is conduct some sort of evaluation of what is the BYU experience and interview a ton of students and find out what it's even like. What are the things that really are there and what, what people really appreciate about it? And then we can kind of look at that and say, okay, now we've got all these things that people love about it. What would we lose? What will we not lose? You know, I don't know. And there, there's, also, there's also uh -huh. some existing data sets that could be looked at, but probably new yeah. things that need to be pursued. Over here. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I attended Dr. Wiley's Open Education Conference, 
And in one of the sessions that I helped to record, um, I don't remember who the presenter was. He was from the UK though, and and he was he taught photography classes. But he, he shared a lot online and he gathered this pool of people who were just really interested in what he was doing and it didn't diminish from people taking his classes. He kind of wondered if it was going to affect, you know, people buying his work and from people taking his classes, but but because people were flocking to to what he was doing and the tutorials online that were available and accessible to everyone, they wanted even more to be a part of the in person you know, real experience. And I think that's kind of human nature. I mean, I think we appreciate what what we can get digitally, but I think it's kind of human nature to want that in-person experience. Um, I notice, so I'm, I'm really utilizing, learning how to utilize Google Plus. I think Google has some really good, I think they're moving in really good directions, and I feel like they're inspired, and I feel like if, if we take hold on things like that, um, that, that people are already using and take take hold of them educationally as well, I think it will provide access to people outside. So for example, the EIME people, they've they've started uploading their their seminars, their video seminars. They they have their own Google Plus um, identity. And and I, I added it to mine. And, and so I get their feeds in my Google Plus, and the other day, uh, one of their seminar videos popped up, and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I think if, if, if our classes become a little bit more transparent that way, in that we are sharing things outside of the classroom, I think that will that, that'll open up um, the BYU experience to, to people outside of the classroom. I mean, they'll, they'll get a taste of it, and they'll understand a little bit more about, about us, and, and I don't really think it will, I, I don't think it will have a negative effect on people wanting to come to the university, but I think it's a way to open our doors. Great. I'm, I'm going to take a couple more comments, but I need to save a few minutes to tell you a few things that we're we are trying to move forward to do, but Charles, do you have a comment? Yeah, I'll just make mine really short. I think I think sometimes we we have this idealized view of what the BYU experience is or what the educational experience is. And my view is that really that's changing all the time. I mean, my mother attended BYU back in the, you know, and part of the BYU experience was going down to the Smith Field House, waiting in long lines to get, you know, to get basketball tickets. Yeah. My dad was at BYU. He, he did programming for his, you know, statistics and stuff using a little punch card and a big mainframe and a, you know. So I think that sometimes we we kind of idealize these things. The fact is, we're living in a world that's constantly changing, and we we want to change with that, and hopefully channel things like Andy was saying so that it changes for, for the better. Uh, the idea of like when books started, I mean I remember looking at early technologists that were using slates and chalk. You know, that was the technology to help students learn to write. And some had sandboards where they put the sand on a table, people would write in the sand and they would wipe it out. So it, it made it so they could do it more cheaply, you know, than, than what they had before. When books and libraries started to be, become available, that changed. That changed the way people started to think about education. And just for the record, I never used Friday in the <laughs> <laughs> So I, was, I just, I, just I was pretty good at one time with mobile overhead projectors and overlays and transparency. I just think you know, life changes. Where we're at changes, and we need to try and figure out how to use the best of the things that are coming along. To make improvements and to change, you know, to change along with it. Um, any comment? Just a quick one. One of the assumptions that's kind of built into our discussion here is that that people want to learn. Um, the challenge to me, if, if we are considered stewards of technology, one of the responsibilities that we have is to help people see the value of learning 
and technology is the tool. There are so many people that are ignorant or live in cultures that are relatively ignorant or live in cultures that want to level them down to their level and stay ignorant. I think somehow, I think somehow we need to speak to them and not just to our own satisfactions of learning. We, we enjoy learning. Somehow we've got to help people understand the value of learning and desire to learn. And I think that applies to a worldwide audience. Well, let me uh, cut off some of this. It's interesting. I would love to listen to you talk about a lot of things and your students and your faculty. Let me just say a few things that I think are important. Uh, I, I think there are a number of things that we're doing and we need to continue to do and we need to get better at doing it. Uh, and this speaks partly to what you were saying a minute ago, but one of them is obviously research. One of the, one of the main things that a university does is engage in high quality, meaningful research. As Elder Iron put it a few years ago when he visited us, uh, research of consequence, research that really asks the tough questions and makes a difference. And we do that, and we need to continue to do that, and we need to continue to do it better, more of it and make our contribution uh, to the field, the various fields that we represent. And that's crucial. Uh, and I, I would hope all of you, wherever you're going as uh, students when you graduate and move on, you go with a spirit of inquiry and you ask, you ask questions, you ask good questions and tough questions and try to help find the answers to questions. And if we don't do those the, the research nowadays, it's difficult if, if we're always just in our own little corner of the world and uh, shut the door and do our thing because we need to, we need to be able to concentrate and do good work, but we need to be able to learn and interact with a lot of people. There are a lot of people who have very strong feelings and evidences and data and experiences that suggest to them that we could be making serious mistakes if we try to rush too fast with the use of technology in the sense of software and hardware and so on and integrate that into education. There are others that are pushing so hard that uh, they're just, they, they can't understand or believe why we're not light years ahead of where we are right now. But if we're not communicating and really listening and interacting and looking at what has to be studied and then the tough, tough questions that you refer to Rick and, and others, we need to be able to, to work collaboratively to do that sort of thing. That's, uh, those things are important. We need to do a lot of sharing uh, of information. And uh, it's easier than ever to do that, but to do it in a way that we reach the right audiences and the right people and we share things in meaningful ways. Uh, we need, let me step back to the scholarship for a minute. We need to make sure the research and the scholarship we do is sound, it's valid, it's there. We don't need, we don't need uh, I can say this because I spent some years at the University in Salt Lake up on the hill there. Uh, we don't need cold fusion kinds of research coming out. We need stuff where, where the research is good and it, it is, it's done well and it's done to high standards and it's rigorous. And the outcomes mean really to stand up in the, the scientific world. And we need to continue to get better at doing that at the UAU and taking the tough questions, working collaboratively sharing those sort of things. I think we also have to look at how we share with the world the benefits of the things we do, the benefits of our research, the benefits of our creative works, our innovations. Uh, we have to be able to share that with the world and not just share it through journals and publications because those are relatively small audiences that read those. So we have to look at multiple ways we disseminate the benefits of our research. Uh, some, some research uh, is disseminated best if we create, look at ways to create forms, conferences and workshops and seminars and things beyond just our own groups, but spread more broadly those things. Start opening up so we do, we do help you, a significant part of conferences and things that bring in large bodies of people uh, and interact. And so we need to have a lot of ways to disseminate. Some kinds of research lends itself to the development of products that can actually be tangible, can be, the results can be disseminated, and can be used in K-12 schools and universities or whatever. <coughs> so there are a number of different ways we have to do that. Uh, and 
And so I think uh, as students, you need to, you have an obligation, in my opinion, to keep talking with us and sharing with us, challenging us, sharing with us where where you see from your experiences where we need to be going and what we're doing that's on track and what's not. Uh, I hope, I hope that in, if I came back here and talked to students and interacted with people in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the IPT department would be different than what it is today. Now that's not because I think there's anything wrong with it today, there's anything bad about it. But if it's the same today, 10 years, 15 years out in the future, then as it is today, then there are problems. Uh, things have to constantly be changing and learning and improving. Now I hope there's some really important critical things that are happening today in IPT and in the other department in the college that is so good, we'll never lose it, and that we preserve some of those things. Uh, and, and one of many examples would be the spiritually strengthening kind of notion that we still, no matter what we do and how effective or efficient what we do with instruction, it lends itself to spiritual strengthening, to strengthening testimonies and our knowledge and expertise to live in a world with those things that we value are important to us. And there are other things that you're doing for that. They're so good, we don't want to lose those things. Just because something's old, see, I can say this now because I'm getting old, just because something's old doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of value. And it's not still good and needed. You know? So there are things that sometimes we discard or we throw out when we shouldn't. And we don't want to do that. We want to examine those things closely. But there are also many new things that are going to constantly be changing. You've got to have that constant, never-ending improvement and growth and changing of things. One of the things that we've been working on for several months in the, in the case world, and you'll hear more about it in, in coming weeks, but um, we, uh, we are creating, I could say we have created, but it's more in the state of creation than, than being finalized, uh, an educational technology research and development laboratory. The notion of the lab is that, um, that it will be a great opportunity for mentoring of undergraduate and graduate students. And that they'll have a chance to be really meaningfully engaged with each other, with faculty, and faculty from any department. This is not an IPT, IPT initiative. Although Andy's had a key part in the planning and will be one of the people who help give leadership to it as it, as it unfolds. But it's not an IP and T thing. In fact, the initial, some of the initial projects and activities and things that are happening, uh, there's, act, there's examples from every department in the college. I think every department. Uh, but there's things that are, that are happening. Uh, we have uh, been blessed with some substantial sums of monies from donors to help operate this R&D lab and to help fund projects where students and faculty can work together to do high quality research that could lead to products and innovation and creative sort of things to help improve the efficiency, the effectiveness, the quality of education here on campus, here within the college, to uh, the children who are out there in our K-12 education. And it's an exciting sort of thing that I think has a lot of potential to help us. Uh, good things are happening, so many good things, I can't keep up with them. But that's, that's a tiny bit of what will happen and needs to happen. And again, we need to find the right balances. We need, we need lots of additional resources. Like I said, we've been blessed with a lot. But we, we're in the process right now of working with several uh, very, very large capacity donors to try to raise another $6 million for research and development funds and activities uh, that can help support students working with faculty, doing great and innovative things uh, across a wide range of interests and topics and so on. So, uh, future of technology and education, while well, it's, I, have, I, I can't begin to work in any kind of a crystal ball and see what that is. Some of you would be far better at doing that than me. But technology will continue to have a huge impact and it will grow and I hope that at BYU and in the McKay School of Education that we're part of the cutting edge of helping us do that. Because I think we can keep perspectives and we can ask the tough questions 
and not lose other things so that we can do blended learning and not do away with the human element and uh, along with um, some of the software and the hardware and other kinds of technology. That we can look at the spiritual strength and the sort of things so we can keep those balances in place. We're better positioned because of who we are than any university in the world to do that. We have been designated by the Reverend as the church's research institution, research university. That's their terminology, that's their designation to us. And uh, they look to us to give leadership in those areas and to do research of consequence and development and project development and product development and those kind of things and be out there in that edge. And, and one of the challenges, I'll end with this, one of the challenges I think IPT has as a department, but the same is true of every other department in our, in our college is we have to be far more collaboratively than we are already. If we don't talk to each other, if we're not sharing, if we're not trying to figure out how to work together and support one another, that will hinder progress. We've got to become engaged with each other as faculty and, and work together and think together and, and debate together and have pleasant arguments together you know, and with different ideas and concepts, so we all learn them together and work together to do those things. And, uh, but the, I think that the future is just so exciting, you know. I, I mean, I just, I can't wait to the projects I'm going to take on 20 years from now, uh, you know, because I hope I'm still engaged in, in, in the fun, exciting things that are happening going on. So thank you. Thank you for your input and your comments, for helping to teach me, uh, for being audience, good listeners and, and interactors, so thank you very much for letting me come.